We both got our doctorates from the same institution. We're both bilingual in the same languages, but only one of us is a trained sniper. <laughs> Top leaders. Meaningful conversation. Actionable advice. Bulldoze complacency. Ignite inspiration. Create impact. Produced by the Southwestern family of companies. This is the Action Catalyst. Today's guest is Dr. Ruth Gotian, speaker, educator, and author of the book The Success Factor, which outlines her research on extreme high achievers. Scientific journals have labeled her as an expert in leadership, mentorship, and development, and she is currently a contributor to Forbes and Psychology Today magazines, where she writes about how to optimize success. We hope you enjoy. So I'm sure you get this all the time, but I am from that generation that the most famous psychologist, psychiatrist, doctor of my generation would be, of course, Dr. Ruth. The original. <laughs> the original. So it's going to be very difficult for me to call you Dr. Ruth and stay on task. So I've met many times the original Dr. Ruth, and we have many things in common. We both worked at the same institution, not at the same time. We both got our doctorates from the same institution. We were both in our 40s when we got our doctorate. We're both bilingual in the same languages, but only one of us is a trained sniper. <laughs> That's awesome. She's a ball of fire, the original. Okay, well, what can you do? That's cool. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked to Nobel Prize winners and astronauts and Olympic champions and NBA champions and talk about success and what it takes to get there. Really hanging out with some losers, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to, right? It's a tough job. So everybody has these ideas of what they think overachievers are like. In all of your research, in conversation with them, what would be the things that people would be surprised to learn or know that these highly accomplished individuals have in common? Well, one of the things to notice is that it's not about the habits they don't have the same habits because they're different. Even if you're comparing Olympians to each other or Nobel Prize winners to each other, it's not about habits. And I think that's where we've been getting it all wrong all these years. We've always been taught to wake up at 5 a.m. and read for three to eight hours a day and that'll make you successful. But that doesn't fit with all of our lives, right? But there are elements of what they have done, their mindsets that we can emulate. And there's four of them. And the one that surprised me the most was the fourth one. And that fourth one is just opening your mind up to new knowledge. So we heard that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Mark Cuban read for three to eight hours a day. But that's not what made them billionaires. What made them billionaires was that they opened their minds up to new knowledge. And once you start getting all this information, and all this data and all these ideas, and you can start making connections between two disparate points and these are connections that other people don't yet see, that's when you have innovation. That's when you have greatness. That's when you have all these big, bold ideas. That's why they're so successful. So it's not that they were reading that made them so successful. It's that they opened their minds up to new knowledge. And we can all do that. We're already doing that, right? So they were reading books. You can read articles. You can read newspapers. You can watch webinars. You can watch LinkedIn learning courses. You can listen to podcasts. Hopefully the listeners are going to learn something new today other than the difference between the original Dr. Ruth and me. <laughs> but there's so many ways that we can learn new things and opening our mind up and all of a sudden we'll say, oh, I heard this was done. Maybe we can use that in my job. And aha, that's the big aha moment. That's how you get these new things to happen. So I could see that direct lineage from people who build businesses, invent things, and then like from an athlete, what is an athlete learning that helps them connect these dots that they become world-class? One of the people who I got to interview was Apollo Ono. Apollo Ono is the most decorated Winter Olympian. He has, I think, eight medals. Also got the uh, Mirabal Trophy on Dancing with the Stars. And when I was talking to him, people say, which uh, interview surprised you the most? And it was definitely Apollo Ono, because when I was talking to him, it was like talking to a colleague. So yes, he knew everything he needed to know about short track speed skating, but he knew more about positive psychology and sleep and nutrition and all of these other things, adult learning, just like my colleagues would. 
And he learned all that because he realized that if he could get in the mindset of the positive psychology, if he understood the nutrition, if he understood the sleep, if he understood how to get into what we call a state of flow when time melts away, then he would be at peak performance. So that's why he, on his own, he studied all of these things. It's pretty cool. That is super fascinating. And there has been a renewed focus on sleep. So I would love just to speak on the importance of that. I will tell you what I do know is we all need a certain amount of sleep. And what you need is not going to be what I need. And every single person is different. And it's not about waking up at 5 a.m. This is why I go so nuts when I hear these, these are the habits of high achievers, wake up at 5 a.m. It's not about that. It's about what you are doing during your peak performance hours. So I happen to be one of those 5 a.m. risers. And my peak performance hours are probably around 7 to 11. This is when I am at my sharpest. This is when I get things done in a fraction of the time. This is when I can do that deep work. So I make sure to block that time for my deep work, which for me is a lot of writing and editing, which means my passive tasks that don't take the same amount of focus and energy such as Zoom meetings and responding to email and social media posts and things like that, I reserve those for the afternoon hours when I'm a bit more sluggish and things take a little bit longer. I am not going to burn my peak performance time doing passive tasks. And the high achievers learn to optimize their peak performance hours. Now, if you are a night owl and your peak performance hours are 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., Go for it and do your high performance, deep thinking work during those hours. Don't try to do it at 5 a.m. if you only went to bed at 2 a.m. But figure out which are your peak performance hours. Figure out how many hours you need to sleep to function and leverage that. And you will see that you will get so much more done in a fraction of the time and it'll be better work. Super helpful. Okay, so I'm going to go back to something else you said in reflection on your time with Apollo Ono. Power of flow. Talk to me about that. So flow is what that means. It's a, it's a term in positive psychology, and it means you are working on something where you are appropriately challenged and you have the right amount of support. So it's not so easy that you just start to poo-poo it. And it's not so hard that you're completely overwhelmed. It's just the right amount of challenge to say, oh, this is really cool. I want to figure this out. Like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Some people really love that, right? When you get to that point and you start working on things, you are actually at your happiest and you start to focus. You're in your deep focus time because what happens is you're really working on that. Time melts away. You're not tired. You're not hungry. You're not thirsty. You don't need to go to the bathroom. You are so focused, you are able to block out everything around you. When you're able to do that, you are in a state of flow. It is so hard to get to, but when you're able to get to it, you don't want to leave it. And in the book, In the Success Factor, I talk about ways that you can optimize that state of flow, how to turn down the noise that's all around you, how to turn down the distractions, and that if you're able to work in your peak performance hours, and get to a state of flow, well, now you're unstoppable. I tell people the book was written on weekend mornings. You know, it's interesting. You said something there, too, in that that's when you're happiest. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would hear you say, hey, I worked weekends to get this done. They go, oh, well, you know, I, I, you know, that's when my downtime, that's when I, but you did it because that made you happy. That was my choice. That was definitely my choice. Remember, the pandemic was happening. We couldn't go anywhere. So if I was going to be at home, I was going to make the most of it. And I'm not the only one. That's why so many people were able to get so productive during the pandemic when other people couldn't get off the couch. Oh, that's a whole can of worms in and of itself. (laughs) Okay. So here we are Mm post-pandemic and every day there's conversation about pulling people back to the office. Mm Mm-hmm. Look, I think everyone needs to do what's right for them individually and as an organization. But I think these are conversations that need to happen, and it's not a one-size-fits-all model. This is such an individual thing. That's got to be super difficult. That's why we need to talk to people. And we've sort of forgotten how to do that. Our conversations, every conversation we used to have in the hallway in the office, 
now becomes an official Zoom meeting on the calendar. And that's exhausting. I don't know about you, but there's a limit to how many Zoom meetings I can have in one day. So everything has become so formal. And there's something in adult learning that we call the informal learning. The informal learning, it's, it's not just what happens outside of the classroom. It's those random acts that happen. When you bump into someone in the break room by the coffee machine and you start to talk about something, that can lead to an idea. And those moments are gone. So maybe there's a way that we can still have that, still allow people to work virtually if they need it, but also to come in so we can have those sparks. You know, like that. Okay, so I'm going to jump back to your book. Give us the four parts that you talk about in the book. Sure. So the book is called The Success Factor. I have always been fascinated. It's been a very healthy obsession with success. Why do some people have it and some people don't? And how do some people get it and maintain it and other people don't? I've always been interested in the stories, what's below the waterline. So when I interview people, I tell them, I'm not interested in what I can Google about you. I'm much more interested in what it took to get there. Because I have learned that high achievers are 400% more productive than the average person. So as we had this great resignation, everyone was walking out. Well, we need to not just replace those people, we need to replace them with the right people. And if we have those high achievers, Not only are we replacing people, we're actually being more innovative. So who are these high achievers and how do we get them? So at the age of 43, I went back to school to get my doctorate to study this. And over the years, I have just added different kinds of high achievers. So I've interviewed Nobel Prize winners and astronauts and Olympic champions and other Olympians and NBA champions and NFL Hall of Famers and Fortune 500 CEOs and senior politicians, and the list keeps growing and growing. And I realized that a Nobel Prize winning scientist is just like a bedazzled Olympic champion figure skater. And if that's the case, I realized that success can be learned. But I was frustrated because I have three degrees. I don't remember having a single class on how to be successful. So I decided that I was going to figure this out and I was going to create the blueprint. And that's what I did with the book, The Success Factor. And I found out that it's not habits. It is mindsets. And there's four of them. The first one, and you have to do all four, but here's the first one that needs to happen. You need to figure out what you were put on this earth to do, what you love more than anything, what feels like play to you, right? I was writing on the weekends because I loved it. I read so much because I love it. To me, that's not work, that's play. Because when you can tap into your intrinsic motivation, what you would do for free if you could, when challenges are thrown at you, you don't give up. So this is different from extrinsic motivation. When you're doing something for an award, medal, bonus, promotion, that's really hard to maintain because that's when other people are judging you. But when you do it for yourself, nothing can stop you. And if your listeners want to figure out how they can figure out what is it that they're so passionate about, I have created a worksheet that they can do something I call a passion audit. It's a simple three-column exercise to figure what it is that you love to do. And they could just download it for free from my website at ruthgotian, G-O-T-I-A-N dot com slash passion audit. So that's the first one. The second element of success is how you approach challenges. So I share the story of Dr. Peggy Whitson, who was working as a biochemist at NASA for years, and she wanted to be an astronaut. But she applied and was rejected over and over and over again. But she said, I know I'm going to become an astronaut. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how. I just need to figure out the strategy to convince them I will be a good astronaut. Well, ultimately, she became an astronaut, spent more days in space than any American astronaut, became the first female commander of the International Space Station, then went on to become NASA's chief astronaut. So when you're faced with a challenge... You have to ask yourself, it's not if, it's how. And you ask yourself, what is the strategy I haven't thought of yet? The third one is what made you great at the beginning is what you keep on doing later on. You don't rest on your laurels. You don't just prepare, you over-prepare. As they say in the military, you train hard and fight easy. 
And I share the preparation process of Neil Katyal, who argued 48 cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. And he has done the same three things as part of his preparation practice in all 48 cases. He doesn't say, oh, I've done this before. I don't need to do it again. He keeps doing it. And that's why the NBA players have the same warm-up routine that you would see in any junior high school. The only thing that's different is they have more expensive sneakers. And then last but not least is what I was talking about before is opening your mind up to new knowledge and figuring out how you can learn things, books, podcasts, LinkedIn learning courses, and also surrounding yourself with a team of mentors who are your guides by your side. And those are the four. Okay, so let's talk about that. This team of mentor. We aren't taught how to go and pick. I mean, most of us, I think, just stub our toes into good mentors. But if there's a science to it, man, we got to know it. Yeah, actually, the best way is the organic mentors, because these are people who you connect with. And the tip that I give people is don't ever, 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 ever ask anyone to be your mentor. Because when you do that, you're asking them to take on another job another responsibility, another obligation. And I don't know about you, but I don't know people who have that kind of remnants of time. So instead, you want to ask people for their perspective on something, for their experience on something. So you can say, oh, I am working on this project. I am stuck on this one thing. I know you've worked on this before. Could I schedule 15, 20 minutes so I can run this by you? And I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm missing. You want to establish that relationship where people get to know, like, and trust you. And when they know, like, and trust you and they see the promise in you, they start to take you under their wings. Don't worry about the label of mentor. That'll come. That'll come when the mentee gives them the title. It's really somebody who shares their knowledge and experiences with you. And if anyone's interested in developing their own mentoring team, there's another worksheet that they can download, which will take them right through it. I also describe it in full in the book. It's ruthgotian.com slash mentoring team. It sounds like that's a, a great tie into what you were saying earlier about this formal conversation versus the informal and the formal learning versus the informal learning. And I love how you come right out of the gates and say, hey, don't ask somebody, right? I, will you be my mentor? Just when you were saying those words, it was like I could feel the weight of responsibility. And yeah, it just changes the dynamics versus, okay, I better get this right. They're counting on me. You know, this is this role I now have to play. Yep. You know, it's interesting. I gave a keynote once and I said at the keynote, don't ever ask anyone to be your mentor. It sounds like an obligation, right? Afterwards, I very often get emails from the people who are in the audience and they said, oh, Dr. Gautian, I loved your talk. Will you be my mentor? Here's my dissertation. I'd love to get your perspective. (laughs) I was like, hon, we need to step this back a little bit. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. So another thing I think um, I really liked what you said is when you go into an interview with somebody, when you're doing your research, it was, hey, I don't know. I know what I can read on Google. Yeah. I want to know what's not there. So what's not there for you? For me personally? Yeah. Ooh, wow, you just really turn the tables. <laughs> I don't usually get asked about me that way. Um, I have always been extremely competitive. And the path that worked for everyone else never really worked for me. So I always had to <laughs> just create a path. And it was not without a lot of heartache because there was no precedence for certain things. So For example, uh, when I was in fifth grade, it was a long time ago, probably before Title IX, recess was broken down by gender. The boys played soccer. The girls traded stickers. And if you had googly eyes, that that was extra valuable. Well, I was not so interested in the high commodity sticker exchange. I just wanted to kick a ball around. And I remember my fifth grade teacher said, I'm sorry, but girls don't play soccer. Well, that didn't sound right to me because I couldn't, I mean, I was 10. I couldn't figure out there was nothing physically wrong that I couldn't play. So I couldn't understand. Now, remember, this is before we had the Mia Hams and, you know, the Megan, all these people. So I went to the library 
and I took out every single book that had a picture of a girl playing soccer. That Monday morning, I put it on my teacher's desk. It was, you know, two feet high. And I said, I'd like to revisit that conversation about girls playing soccer. P.S. Girls have been playing soccer at that school ever since. And I recently had a conversation with a friend of mine because I played varsity in high school. And I still, I was cleaning out some stuff and I found my cleats. And I'm like, why am I not throwing out these cleats? Like, I haven't worn them in 35 years, right? And I think it's just a symbol of that independence. That, I think, has just been woven into everything that I do, right? I'm a doctor who's not a physician who works in academic medicine. I study high achievers across industries, not just one industry. I do things differently. And um, sometimes it's amazing, but sometimes it's extremely isolating because nobody understands. I really appreciate you sharing that. Like you said, it's so interesting, not just what people accomplish, but the why. And in that, not only did I just hear a super vulnerable story that you heard some, and I, I always am cautious with this word, but the right kind of pride in the sense that because you were doing things differently, it made a difference. Yeah. But then I also heard part of your way is when someone tells you something, part of your response is to go do some research, which is exactly what you said, how you came up with the book was, hey, I've got three doctorates and I I know a lot of stuff and not a single class was on how to be successful. So by golly, I better go find that out. And that's how you do. You know, I, I didn't even realize that, but you summed it up perfectly. And I think unless it's your personal safety, when someone tells you no, it really just means not yet. And I need to figure out how to convince you to make this happen. You just wanted to kick a ball at recess. That's all I wanted to do. And what was so funny was that there was no girls team for me to play with. And they had to put me somewhere because I wouldn't go away. So they put me with the boys team. And they were not kind. <laughs> <laughs> they, yep. Not happy to have you on that team. But you know what? That made me better. So when I got to high school, I right away played with the varsity team. Average becomes the people that you're around, right? So yeah. it made me better. So that's why I'm on a mission to make average the floor, not the ceiling of what we can achieve. Wow, that's a powerful statement. So what's next? I am working on my next book. It's on mentoring because I realized all the high achievers have a team of mentors. So I knew I needed to pull the string on that a little bit. But I'm still contacting a lot of high achievers, and we're having those great conversations about mentorship. And I'm, I'm just honored that I get to do this and tell their stories. That is so cool. I know we just have a couple of minutes left, and I want to be super respectful of your time. Anything you want to make sure we get to talk about in our time together? Well, people are usually curious how I got to talk to people like Dr. Tony Fauci and the nine-time NBA champion, Steve Kerr, and, you know, Apollo Ono, and all kinds of really amazing, amazing people. And that's where the power of networks comes in. I really needed to find one astronaut, one Olympian, right, one Nobel Prize winner. And if I did my job well, and people would notice that this is a real study, and I'm here to showcase the good in what they do. I'm not a tabloid reporter. And they get to know, like, and trust me. Then what happened without my even asking is they started referring me to other people. And one just led to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And many of them have become really good friends. And at the beginning, we didn't even start talking about work. That came, that came much later. We talked about what we have in common. And trust me, when I say we all have something in common with the Nobel Prize winners and the astronauts and the Olympic champions, because we're all human, we have something in common. We just haven't figured it out yet what it is. And if we talk enough with people, we'll figure it out. And one of the things I try to tell people when I coach them is that when you are meeting somebody whom you don't know, you need to have a toolkit with conversation starters to kick off a conversation. There's always something that you can talk about. I once talked about, I was interviewing someone who had these enormous trophies in the back. And I said, I know who gives those enormous trophies. That's martial arts. Because I have spent many hours in a karate dojo watching my kids. 
So I knew that they have those those big trophies. So I said, well, which martial arts did you do? And he said, well, how did you know I do martial arts? So I explained the story. He said, well, I do um, karate. I said, well, what kind? Right. So if you know that there's more than one kind, that already has this conversation. Now, I don't do what he does, but we were able to have that conversation. And that was over trophies that I saw in the back of his room. I put together 13 of my favorites, again, right on my website, ruthgotian.com slash conversation. And this is how I've kicked off conversations with astronauts and NBA champions and Nobel Prize winners. And you can too. Super cool. I really appreciate your time. And thank you so much for your willingness to share, especially some of the things that uh, are a little bit more vulnerable. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, one last question. Will you be my mentor? (laughs) (laughs) If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. And to stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and on Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. And as always, thanks for listening. 